Hey guys, Trevor Boone. And Tyler Gresky. From Emerald City Guitars. We're down in Palm Springs, California. And we're gonna be showing you guys an amazing guitar collection. We're calling it the Beatles Guitar Collection. This is a collection that's taken 20 years to complete. It's one of the most intentional collections I've ever seen. It can almost be looked as a singular art installation. Also, let's note that some of these guitars would be left-handed because Paul is a left-handed player, but most guys are right-handed, so this is going to be a right-handed guitar collection. It goes through every guitar the Beatles were associated with from the early Quarrymen days to later on their careers and all the changes that they experienced. This collection has been featured in Guitar Aficionado, Sitting next to us, we have the Beatles gear, which is a Bible book for anybody who's a Beatles fan. And it can almost be used as a reference that shows every guitar in this collection. So we're gonna kind of be connecting the dots, giving some background stories, some cool history on some of these instruments you might recognize, some you might not. Uh, there's a lot to cover, but we're gonna jump into it. All right, so let's start with the early, early Beatles slash Quarrymen guitars. This is a Gallatone Champion, a South African made instrument, very much a budget guitar. This is the same model that was John's first guitar. And his mother was a banjo player, so his playing was heavily influenced by banjo. In fact, he's quoted with saying he'd only tune five strings and people would laugh when they'd see that six string flopping around. You never see these around, they're so hard to find. It's not a really expensive guitar, but good luck finding another one. And it's so cool to have the exact model of John Lennon's first guitar. Mm -hmm. And right here we actually have a Zenith Model 17, which is widely known as Paul's first guitar. Uh, it's funny, back in those days, in the late 50s, guitar wasn't nearly as popular as it is now, so most kids had other instruments. Now, Paul's dad had given him a trumpet to learn. Uh, he wasn't about it. So he took that trumpet into a local music store in Liverpool and traded it for this exact model of guitar. So one thing that's particularly special about this actual guitar uh, can be seen when you look on the back of the headstock. It has the original store sticker from where the guitar was bought, and it just happens to be the same store that Paul got his at. So not only is this the same year, the same model as Paul's first guitar, but it was bought at the same store in Liverpool. Now, for all we know, this could have hung on the wall next to Paul's. Just an unbelievable coincidence and just such a gem in this collection. So sticking with the theme of the early, early guitars, this is a Framus 5-1. This model was another one of Paul's really early guitars. He had one like this that was strung lefty. He got the guitar in the late 50s, but he was seen using it for writing and in the studio up into the mid 60s. So it was one that he really, really loved. Uh, and it was rumored that he might've got it from his dad. So uh, just great history, cool little parlor guitar that Paul played for a long time. So here we have a great example of a Hofner present, a gorgeous guitar. This is an instrument that George had while he joined the Quarrymen. So this is the nicest instrument in the Quarrymen at that time. It retailed for 33 pounds. Everyone else's instruments were about half of that much. It still holds up, beautiful instrument, and this is a great example. All right, so here we have what I think is one of the coolest guitars in this entire collection. It's a Hofner Club 40. It was the first dedicated electric guitar in the Quarrymen, and there's actually more than one in the Quarrymen. The Hofner President that we saw just a moment ago was actually traded for one in 1959. And around the same time, John got one as well. So the story with John's is that his aunt actually put down 17 pounds on what was a 30 pound guitar and set up a payment plan for the rest. So you can see that this model kind of influenced the direction that John was going with his guitar style being the shorter scale. So something really cool about this model is that kind of every member in the Quarrymen had a, had a turn with it. John eventually got a Rickenbacker, his first Ricky. There's a lot of good pictures of the Quarrymen where Paul is in fact using John's guitar strung left-handed. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is one of my favorite guitars in the collection. Tyler and I were geeking out over this thing. It's a 1958 Futurama, the only one I've seen in the flesh. What makes this guitar so special is it's a blatant copy of a 58 Strat, as if somebody drew it on a napkin and tried to design it off memory. But some points of this guitar are so similar to Fender. I mean, if you look at the back of this neck, the checking, the skunk stripe, even the shape of the neck, it so closely resembles a Fender Stratocaster. They could not get Strats at that point. It's the closest thing they could get to a Strat at that point. This guitar was made in Czechoslovakia, and George is noted for saying how badly this instrument played, but Dang, it looked good. That brings up a really interesting point. Of course, all these young bands in England grew up watching Buddy Holly and the Crickets, seeing him play his Mapleboard Strat. They just worshipped him. They wanted a Strat like it, but they couldn't get Strats, and that was for a very specific reason. From 1953 to 1959, the United Kingdom had a trade embargo with the United States that forbode 
United States exports from entering the country. So even if you wanted a Strat, you couldn't get one. You had to look elsewhere, uh, in this case, to Eastern Europe, and that is why the Futurama is a thing. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the Rickenbacker 325. 90% of the pictures you'll see of John, he's holding this. It's quintessential to the Beatles sound. These 325s are short scale, perfect for rhythm. This is where you start seeing some of those American made guitars coming into the scene. The trade embargo was up and the Beatles had a little bit more money. We're starting to get these cool guitars such as Rickenbackers. And you know, you've seen this on the Ed Sullivan show, probably most importantly. And they were painted black because Brian Epstein said that they will appear better on television. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like you said, just such an iconic model, especially for John. He had them in multiple configurations. He had 12 strings, he had different finishes. Uh, the first one he got was actually in 1960. It was a 1958 model, kind of like the one you see behind us. He actually got it in Hamburg, where American guitars at that time uh, were a lot more common than they were in the United Kingdom. Just a great, like I said, iconic guitar, still associated strongly with him to this day. All right, so if you're a Beatles fan, you're gonna recognize this instrument. This is a 1964 Hofner 501, which eventually got coined as the Beatle Bass. Paul ordered one directly from the Steinway company, or Steinway store in, uh, in Liverpool, and probably not the first left-handed one they ever made. It was lightweight, so you could bop around, and you know, obviously it was a symmetrical, so he kind of envisioned what to expect when he got his lefty. And something about this bass is just how it's set up, the long, thin neck. It makes you play a certain way that I feel it really influenced kind of the Beatles bass playing, really melodic and kind of bouncing up and down the neck. So this is a model that you see tons of footage with Paul using one. It is probably, I mean, it goes hand in hand with Paul McCartney and just a classic, classic addition. And here we have an authentic 1964 example. All right, we have another one of my favorites here, 1957 Duo Jet. Now this was George's first serious guitar and it actually has a pretty cool story behind it. You know, for years and years and years, George had just been pining for an American guitar. When the Beatles were living in Hamburg, George would write to his friends in Liverpool about how cool he thought Strats were and Fenders were great, but the guitar that he really wanted was a Gretsch. And that dream came true for him in 1961. He was back in Liverpool just reading a local newspaper and in the classified section he saw an ad for a 1957 duo jet and it was one that an english sailor had actually bought in america brand new in 57 and brought back to england so george had been saving up for some time uh, he called the guy up paid 75 pounds and never really looked back i mean this is really really closely associated with george he used this extensively in the first american tour it's all over the recordings, pictures everywhere. You can't think about George Harrison without thinking about one of these, and that's why it's one of my favorites. All right, so you're gonna hear this out of my mouth a bunch, but this is another one of my favorite guitars in this collection. There's so many, but truly this is a special guitar. It's a 1962 Gibson J160E. There are only 137 made this year. So to see another example in this condition is just astonishing. Cool thing about this model is that John used that J160E on every single Beatles record. On some song, somewhere, you hear this guitar. Really interesting instrument. In general, it's a cool, you know, flat top Gibson with that strange pickup in the neck, and but through a cool amp, it sounds perfect, and you can hear it in so many Beatles albums. So next to me is a really cool reissue of the J160, which kind of represents how that model evolved with the Beatles. John and George both had one. One got stolen, they got a replacement, they were painted, they were stripped. So it's really cool that they kind of honored that evolution of this model. And uh, of course it's included in this collection. So it's sort of tough to think about Beatles tone without imagining a Gretsch guitar through a Vox amp. I mean, George had a number of these throughout his career in varying configurations, a few of which are represented right here. But it kind of represents a cool time for the Beatles. George got his first one in May of 63. Uh, they were first starting to have a little bit of success and get a little bit of money in their pocket. And they wanted their gear to reflect that. And they certainly did with these Gretsch guitars. Extremely, extremely expensive at the time. This country gent in 63 retailed for 264 pounds which was so, so, so much money, especially considering their first guitars that they were playing mere years earlier were like 15 pounds. So it just represents a huge, huge progress uh, as a band and uh, as gearheads as well. Also, Ed Sullivan guitar, this is the mm. guitar that appeared on that. And I think any instrument mm -hmm. that is part of that performance is, uh, you know, gets an extra star on it. 
So needless to say, this is an absolute essential piece in any Beatles collection. Mm -hmm. So one of my favorite tunes that always kind of sticks out is And She Loves You, which features classical guitar. And in 1964, George Harrison was getting into Segovia and some classical music, and that's when he picked out a 1964 Ramirez. And this closely resembles the guitar that George would be playing. Beautiful, beautiful, top quality instrument and very recognizable in a couple of those Beatle tunes. So early 1965, uh, the Beatles had been touring in America for a while. Uh, being exposed to a lot of American music, including a lot of Motown records. And at this time, uh, George and John kind of realized that they didn't like their guitar tone. The Rickenbacker through the Vox just wasn't as good to them as the stuff that they were hearing on these Motown records. So they knew that these American guys were using American guitars, specifically Fenders. So sometime in early 65, uh, they sent out their longtime roadie, Mal Evans, to go find two strats and he came back with two identical Sonic Blue Strats, somehow. So here we have an original custom color Sonic Blue Strat, but as the Beatles evolved, so did their guitars. During the Magical Mystery Tour, everything was colorful, and obviously the guitars followed that pattern. George Harrison took his Sonic Blue Strat and painted it with some day glow paint right out of the tin, used his wife at the time, Patty Boyd's nail varnish, also painted his guitar exactly like this, and it's been forever known as the Rocky Strat. So obviously, you know, that guitar is, is far from here, but what the owner of this collection did is source a Sonic Blue Custom Shop Fender Stratocaster, commissioned an artist in New York to do an exact replication of that paint job, and it turned out amazing. Uh, it's so cool to see something like this in the flesh, because you've seen it in books and pictures, but to have it recreated just so meticulous and perfect is awesome and priceless. Mm -hmm. So here's a cool one. At a time where the Beatles had a little bit more money, you're seeing them with more expensive guitars. They kind of went back in time with this one, but a guitar that totally served its purpose, earned her keep. This is an old Framus Hootenanny 12 string. Don't see these very often. You'll hear it on the help sessions, Hide Your Love Away, songs like that. Really cool 12 string that they probably just needed, but ended up keeping. It's awesome to see one in the flesh. You see a lot of pictures of these during the time, but you don't see a lot in real life. And here we have an original Framus Hootenanny. So here we have what is probably the most recognizable Beatles 12 string model. This is of course the Rickenbacker 360-12. George had more than one of them in his career. The first one he had was actually one of the first 12 string guitars that Rickenbacker ever made. This is back in 1963. It looked very, very much like this, but with the sharp horns and of course the binding on the top here. So the second one was actually gifted to him by a shop in Minneapolis. They had ordered it custom from Rickenbacker and made this big deal about presenting it to him on this radio press conference, uh, sort of as a thank you for what the Beatles did to the guitar market in the <laughs> United States. It absolutely exploded, and as sort of a publicity stunt slash thank you, this store called B-Sharp Music in Minneapolis ordered a brand new 360-12. This was in 1965, and by that time the style had changed a little bit. As you can see, the top is much more rounded over on the newer version. Uh, it is not bound, of course, and also the binding on the back became that really, really cool checkerboard binding. These were very famously used on the recording and live for uh, If I Needed Someone. It was capoed way up at the seventh fret. It's a really distinctive <laughs> sound, but it's just absolute must have for any Beatles collection. So it wouldn't be a proper Beatles guitar collection without the casino. Not only did George and John own a casino, but Paul also had one. He was noted for saying it was a perfect guitar. If he had to choose one guitar, it would be that Buffon Casino. They're top quality, really similar to the Gibson ES330. Beautiful musical instruments that you hear a lot on Revolver. And of course, um, the famous rooftop sessions. You see John with the stripped version. Mm -hmm. A really cool part of this collection is you have the original 65 casino, then you have this awesome American-made reissue where they do the whole strip body, the change knob, it's an exact representation of that guitar. And so really cool combo here that shows you the, the evolution of that famous instrument that every Beatle pretty much used. And so I love this guitar because I don't right away associate the Beatles with a Gibson SG, big humbuckers at that, you know, they're using the Rickenbackers, the switch to strats, but this is a different animal. But it actually is the main guitar on Revolver. Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton were using the big PAF, powerful pickup, so George was kind of chasing that tone and it's such a cool guitar and once you actually dig into it and realize that it was the main guitar, you plug it in those amps and you totally get that sound. 
George loved it, used it a ton. He toured with it in 66. In 69, he eventually gave it to Pete Ham of Badfinger. But just an awesome guitar, and this is a really cool original 1965 SG in remarkable condition. So a really nice addition to the collection. All right, so this is another really cool Beatles Fender, and I just love the story behind it. So from the very early days of the Beatles' success, of course, every guitar and amp manufacturer was trying to get at them, trying to get them to endorse and use their stuff. And for a long time, the Beatles had a sort of handshake deal with Vox. So Fender approached them many times to try to get them to play their amps and their guitars, uh, and the Beatles honored that agreement with Vox for a long time. But finally, in 1968, uh, Don Randall from Fender was able to arrange uh, a meeting with George and John and Yoko Ono for some reason. But they all met up and started talking about gear. And so the result of this meeting uh, was a similar sort of handshake agreement with Don Randall of Fender that any Beatle could get anything from Fender at any time, no questions asked. And uh, the result of that was them acquiring a base six very much like this one. So their base six was used extensively on the White Album. I mean, Helter Skelter, you can totally hear it. It's just really cool, not a guitar that you'd regularly associate with the Beatles or a brand that you really associate with the Beatles, but it was an important part of their lineup at that time. So it's kind of a cool instrument too because they were passing around the room. You can hear mm -hmm. John playing it on Helter Skelter. There's a great isolated bass track that you can listen to and it sounds horrid, but it works for the song <laughs> so well. And it kind of shows you you know, the genius of George Martin puzzling different sounds mm -hmm. together. And somehow they made this work and kind of untraditional instrument, but you know, give it to the Beatles and it's gonna work out, so yeah. During the Sgt. Pepper years, a lot was changing, including their instruments. Paul strayed from his tried and true Hofner Beetle bass, and you'll see him with the Rickenbacker 4001, very similar to this one. A little bit different tone with a lot of mid-range, so it kind of coincides with them exploring some different sounds, and you'll hear it a lot on Sgt. Pepper's, and just a cool, nice addition to this collection. So out of all the ridiculously famous late 50s PAF Les Pauls, uh, you probably won't find one more interesting than one that's uh, simply known as Lucy. It actually started life as a 1957, uh, a gold top, PAF Les Paul, which of course is why the seam is off center, but it actually went back to the factory in the early to mid 60s for a refinish. And the reason that they sprayed it in this sort of cherry red color is that it was the standard finish for SGs at the time. So went back to the factory for a refin and came out with this really distinctive red. So it came to the Beatles actually via Eric Clapton. Uh, he gifted it to George in August of 1968, uh, and actually later that month came back into the studio with the Beatles to play the solo on My Guitar Gently Weeps. So a totally iconic solo played by Clapton on a guitar that was formerly his. It's such an important Gibson that even the company Gibson did this really great reissue of the Lucy guitars through their custom shop. This particular one is unique in the fact that it's the prototype to that run. So along with being a prototype to that cool custom shop run that Gibson eventually did, it's been upgraded with PAT number pickups, the correct tuners, shares the same serial number as the original Lucy. Every nick and aging on this guitar is so accurate to the real one. It's as close as you can get to the actual Lucy Les Paul. Mm -hmm. All right, so here we have probably the most iconic Fender that the Beatles ever used. Uh, this is a 1968 uh, Fender Rosewood Telecaster. Now, uh, George initially received his first one in December of 1968. It was built by a man named Roger Rossmeisel, who was working for Fender at the time. If you recognize the name, it's because he previously worked for Rickenbacker and actually designed a couple of the models that the Beatles used in the earlier 60s. But by 68, he was at Fender building there, and uh, it was his idea for this all rosewood telly. He designed it himself and built it himself. Uh, originally, he actually built two, and when they were all said and done, he tried them both out and sent the best one to George. It's actually rumored on the flight over to England, uh, this guitar had its own seat on the <laughs> plane, which I think is funny, but it was delivered directly to the Apple Studios and was used extensively that year by George. Of course, its most famous was probably the rooftop show that everyone knows and loves. Uh, it actually played the lead part on Let It Be, and of course was also featured heavily in the film, which is why Fender actually ended up putting it into production uh, in 68 and 69, because the demand after that film came out was so high, everyone wanted one. They only made them for a couple years, so they're extremely rare, but this is absolutely the cleanest one I've ever seen. It's a 68, and it is as close to mint as you could ever want. 
So to complete the collection, we gotta have a Martin D28. You see these guitars floating around in some of the late 60s Beatles sessions used for writing. There's pictures of Paul with one on multiple occasions. And one of my favorite all-time guitars, a tried, true, and trusted Martin D28. All right, you guys, thank you so much for watching. There's a lot of information, a lot of cool guitars. We could go on forever about this stuff. We had a lot of fun listening to the Beatles, crawling around, going through this stuff. If you have any questions, call us, email us. We'll be happy to discuss more. Thanks for watching.